This is an introduction to the WinLink global email system. And um, it's uh, it really is global. It's quite impressive. Um, there, there are two aspects to this. Um, the, we're going to be showing you a piece of software called WinLink, but it's not in itself. It's not the WinLink system. It's one aspect of it. So WinLink, the system, is a volunteer project of the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation, and uh, they've been uh, around for quite some time. And nobody gets paid. Obviously, it's a volunteer project. So they are um, doing a lot of really great work um, just because it interests them and it's, and it's helpful. You're going to see um, an email client software package. Um, and really that's what something like Microsoft Outlook is, is it's called a client. And then there's going to be a server out there on the system somewhere. Um, there are other uh, programs. We'll mention a few as we go. Um, with these emails, you can send attachments, um, but uh, there is a comment here. The channel speed is limited, so especially if you're on HF. We can do this on VHF, UHF as well, and uh, the data rate can rise a fair bit. But um, I've experimented with sending uh, um, uh, attachments, you know, like a 10 kilobyte file, and it can take a little while to get through. So you're not going to be uh, sending a you know 10 megabyte uh, video file of the disaster scene or something like that. That's that's not really what this is meant for. So uh, the uh, the uh, software is going to connect to the server system over typically over a radio link, and we'll show you a couple of ways to do that. But alternately, it can be over the internet just using a telnet connection. Um, and so if, if you know you've got a whole bunch of emails waiting, or you, you think you do, and you've got Telnet available, um, you're not out in the field somewhere, or you're, it's not in the middle of a disaster, so your, your internet's down, um, yeah, you might want to first run a Telnet session to just clear the, <laughs> clear the backlog. Um, yeah, you can send or receive email from just about anywhere. Um, uh, th there is a, a variant of, of this software that, that's, um, um, well, there's one called AirMail, and there used to be one called SailMail. I'm not sure if that's around anymore, but um, you can guess that's, that's used by sailors. Uh, so sailors could head out um, and keep up with the world um, over HF radio. And of course, now with the advent of the, uh, the Starlink system uh, that SpaceX is putting up, Maybe, maybe this is going to become slightly less relevant, but you never know what's going to happen. That's the thing. Uh, that There could be a solar flare that takes out a bunch of those satellites, but somehow, you know, the HF keeps running. It's good to have multiple uh, options. So um, when you fire up your software and tell your radio to connect, it's connecting to something called a radio message server uh, or an RMS gateway. And uh, there are RMS gateways scattered all over the place, including uh, a couple here in Calgary. Uh, well, one in Calgary uh, up at the CTV station and another uh, down in High River at the High River Hospital. We'll look at that in a few minutes. Um, these RF gateways will connect <clears throat> typically uh, over the internet to a common message server or CMS. And there are currently, the latest word I've read about the CMSs is, is that there are two of them uh, in different parts of the world. I think one in San Diego, one in Australia, maybe. But they're hosted by Amazon, so I really don't know where they are. Uh, there used to be four or five, and that's well, all in flux. But anyway, so these, um, doing it again, tapping the wrong keyboard. There we go. So um, an email or a message that's sent out onto the system is sent redundantly to all of the common uh, message servers, uh, whether there are two of them or, or 12, it doesn't matter. They go to all of them. And then if you want to retrieve a message, you connect to, the, uh, to a, a convenient gateway and it will then connect to the closest uh, common message server. Um, once the message has been read and down, downloaded and read, um, then it's um, deleted off that common message server and uh, it sends a message to any other CMSs saying, hey, you can, you can delete your copy of it as well. Uh, 
Okay. So here's the, the software that, that we're going to use tonight is called WinLink Express. And it's a popular program to access the WinLink system. Um, there are others here. The list includes Airmail, Output, Outpost. I don't know how to pronounce Wode. <laughs> Not a clue. Pat and Packlink. Um, and um, Dan tells me there are others uh, for Mac and Linux uh, users. Um, Dan, I don't know if you have any uh, names in, in mind uh, at this point. Caught him off guard. He's probably muted. Stuff. Yeah, you did. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> things like Pat is, uh, is a Linux. Uh, it's ported to Linux as well. Uh, I'm told it can work on Mac. So there's no native clients per se, but you can run um, uh, on your Linux box uh, with a web browser. Oh, sure. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. It gives you more flexibility, more like uh, Gmail, I suppose, or something like that. Um, okay, thanks, Dan. There, there are several ways um, to send emails in this system as part of the system. Um, if you're using the system and you're sending an email from WinLink Express or one of these other clients, uh, you would, and you're sending an email to someone else who's also in the system, you just have to use as the as the destination email address their call sign. That's it. Doesn't have to be at anything. It's just their call sign. Uh, if you're emailing a non-WinLink address, then you use the full regular address, like for me, you know, ve6a uh, ve6ei at rac.ca or at arrl.net. You know, those would get through to me. Um, no problem. Uh, or if you're um, not on the WinLink system, and, and this is quite true in emergency services, uh, a lot of these people are going to be using their own uh, email systems, and they will, they want to email someone who is on the WinLink system, they just put in the call sign at winlink.org. All right, so it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, and registering on the system, you do need to register. Um, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just uh, download and install WinLink Express or one of these others. But with WinLink Express in particular, uh, to register is, is, is easy. Uh, just after you install and first run the software, it's going to pop up a form that'll help you walk through that process. And it's very, very straightforward. There's no cost involved. Uh, you uh, can make a donation to the WinLink um, uh, system, if you like, on the winlink.org website. And there it is, pretty easy uh, I, web address, winlink.org. Okay. So just to, to really make it clear, why would I use WinLink? Um, well, it's, it's a, a standard for emergency and dis disaster relief. Um, certainly, uh, teams who are trying to communicate under difficult conditions um, they may, you know, if there's internet access, of course, they're going to use the fastest service they've got available. And, and there may be um, a system like um, uh, Arden, you know, um, um, there's an Arden system uh, being set up around the, uh, the, the southern part of the province here. And this is using, you know, very high frequency, uh, like well up into the multiple gigahertz frequency range that can send and receive internet traffic at multi megabits per second. If you've got a system like that, sure, go ahead and use it. But, uh, but this really, this system is designed for scenarios where, uh, you know, um, what do they call it? Uh, the, you know, what hits the fan, right? Okay. Um, it's also helpful with interoperability because of course, uh, everyone knows how to use email. That's very straightforward. And as noted earlier, you can send from a normal email system on the internet to the WinLink system or vice versa. So that's helpful. Also, um, you might say, well, geez, you're really vulnerable to an internet outage if messages have to go to one of these uh, common message servers via the internet, um, you know, after you've uploaded the message by radio. Um, well, actually, um, there are these things called hybrid RMS gateways, um, which um, allow the RMSs or these gateways to communicate directly with one another. So they could be sharing emails um, 
over VHF or HF links, um, it's going to be slower, obviously, than over the internet. And hopefully in a scenario like that, you're, you're not bombarding the system with a pile of emails, but that capability exists. All right. The other thing I'll jump in, sure, Joel, yeah. if you don't mind, yeah, with I mean, a hybrid is you can configure it. This is like on the back end side, not on you know the end user uh, Winlink Express client side, but uh, on the back end side with a relay that if it can't talk to the CMSs via the internet, then it'll fail over and use HF, for example. Mm -hmm. So that really adds to that robustness. So, you know, the high speed, uh, high throughput, of course, for a relay station would be to transmit to a CMS uh, via the internet. But again, we don't know when that will fail or be, you know, overloaded, whatever. And so then um, it will switch to RF to then ultimately deliver the messages. That's very helpful. Uh, in, in disaster scenarios, it's good to know um, your message is going to get through, you know, no matter what. All right. um, and you can, as it says, this next bullet, uh, connect from almost anywhere, as long as there's HF or VHF capability. Um, Within the email, as you're building an email, you can actually, um, we'll show you this, um, open up a, a template file. And, and as you run um, WinLink uh, Express over, over the weeks and months, you'll be prompted uh, to update your templates uh, regularly. So you can, you can say, I want an ICS 213 uh, template. And once you open that, um, it pops up a web page that has a whole bunch of boxes and you just fill in all the boxes and click submit and that populates um, the email for you and in a standard format. So that really, really helps uh, with, um, again, with the interoperability. Uh, if you've got someone who's not really familiar with, with uh, the formats used by certain organizations. So there's, there's various agencies who use WinLink, um, ARIES, um, amateur radio emergency services and um, radio amateurs of Canada has recently uh, started this new group called the auxiliary communication service um, which is affiliated with ARIES or may replace it I, I really don't know um, we'll just see what happens there but uh, you know, the Red Cross and, and other agencies certainly are using this um, um, on the call also is uh, Ken Olke I believe and Ken and I uh, have been members of uh, CFARS for years, um, Ken much longer than I, and I, I've just uh, kind of stepped back from it because I'm bloody busy, but um, uh, CFARS is um, actually a system that, that works with the Canadian military, and um, the, uh, the, the team uses uh, WinLink uh, fairly extensively for uh, sharing emails okay, over, over HF primarily. And of course, you know, despite everything we say here, anybody can use WinLink. There are all sorts of gateways all over the place. I'll show you a list of, of some of them um, that are relatively close. Um, and it doesn't matter where you go on the globe, you can find out where the closest gateways are and, and send an email to, uh, to friends and loved ones saying, here's, here's where we are this week, you know, um, here out in the back of beyond. All right. Um, once you've started WinLink, we'll, we'll go into the software in a few minutes, but I, I want to give you an introduction. You can see in the lower right, this is the list of, or, or at least part of the list of um, uh, communication options. Okay. The first one, the one that's highlighted is a Telnet session, right? It's going to open up a direct connection to one of these uh, common message servers, the CMSs. All right. Uh, you can use packet WinLink. And it's going to use a connected uh, packet modem like I've got here, a Cantronics KPC3 um, at 1200 baud on VHF, UHF. Um, there are other uh, gateways that might be running uh, 9600 baud um, or maybe even higher, perhaps. Uh, the uh, Pactor WinLink um, is uh, fairly popular still, though the modems are pretty pricey to get the faster ones. Um, if you get, buy an old... Um, AEA, you know, PK232 uh, um, 
multi-function uh, modem, um, it may have Pactor 1 built into it. But as you get up to 2, 3, and now version 4 of Pactor, they get uh, much more expensive. And um, I see Pactor, well, I, I recently sold a Pactor 2 modem that I'd upgraded to 3 for six, seven, seven hundred dollars or something. And that was a bargain <laughs> for the guy who bought it. You spend 2000 on a, on a new one with all the features. So not a lot of people want to do that. It's very, very robust. Um, and uh, some people really like it, but uh, uh, very expensive. Um, Vera is what uh, I've been using recently. And uh, some of the CFARs people are transitioning from Pactor over to Vera. It's, it's just about as good in many ways as a uh, Pactor modem, but it's software running on your computer. Uh, and uh, we'll show you how that works. It's, uh, it's very straightforward. You can get a free version of Vera, um, but uh, you, you probably in the end want to buy a license and it's not very expensive. Uh, there's a version of Vera for HF bands and another version for VHF, UHF bands uh, where it'll, it'll run on an FM radio system. Um, there are numerous other options in there. I'm not going to go through everything, but you'll notice that the P2P versions um, are what we call peer-to-peer -peer sessions, um, or you could call it a point-to-point -point session if you want. That's where um, it's just you talking with somebody else directly and sharing the emails. All right. Um, if you know that, man, really all hell has broken loose and, and you just can't find a gateway anywhere, but you know somebody else is waiting on a certain frequency assignment, you, you can send them uh, a message. All right. <clears throat> Once we get into the software, there are uh, many, many um, gateways, as I've mentioned, and they, they're sitting on various bands on 80 meters, on 40, on 60 meters, on 30, 20. They're all over the place. So you need to have some way of figuring out how to pick a, a, a one that, that will give you a fairly reliable path and communication. Um, this is actually, uh, there's a button there, update via internet right here. Okay, uh, you can click that and it will uh, go out. And if you've got an internet co connection, it'll update that table very quickly for you. Uh, if you uh, don't have internet connectivity, you can click update via radio. It'll create an email making that request and you connect to a gateway. It goes out and a couple of minutes later, you get a, um, a table that you can import that gives you the latest information. You can also see a forecast of solar flux index, all these different things uh, that can help you pick an appropriate uh, gateway. It won't necessarily be, you can see your path reliability 64%, quality 47 That's not very good, but it, I've seen paths listed as much worse than this that work quite well. Um, in the end, um, let me see, have I got a bullet point on this? Yeah. <laughs> These uh, estimates are not always perfect, not by a long shot. I was trying this this very same one here, N7TRY, TRY, and uh, it worked, but boy, it was barely hanging in there. And then I tried V6JTM um, uh, just an hour ago, and that's up at Edmonton area, and I could not hear it at all. Uh, maybe it's my antenna. It's uh, it's it's uh, not so good for north for some reason. Another bit of convenience with that table is that you can click on the headings to sort them by, um, you know, by reliability or by call mm -hmm. sign or whatever. So that's right. Uh, because there could be hundreds. There are hundreds of stations listed. Um, the other thing that that shows is uh, their hours of operation because you know maybe not everybody is online. Uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, the group is typically typically public. Uh, you may find someone that has a group that is unique and custom. You know, they're they're doing an exercise, or, or like yeah. you know, they got some activity going on, and so they choose a different name. And um, and then bearing and distance is uh, interesting to uh, to see as well. You know, mm -hmm. if you know. Uh, somebody's in your skip zone, well, then, you know, at a particular distance on 20 meters at that time of day, uh, that might not be one that you want to try, even though the propagation um, estimate might look favorable. So like Joel says, it's, you know, it's kind of a, a bit of a wag. 
but it is based on propagation data um, that uh, that's available. Yeah, you're you're you get it making an informed guess, I suppose. And I, I keep track of some of the gateways that tend to be more reliable for me. Um, the mode column uh, shows you, by the way, it says V2300 for the first. So that's the, uh, the uh, uh, bandwidth utilization and the maximum data rate. I, I can't remember if it's one or the other, to be honest. Um, the one below it, it says 2750. So that's the fastest uh, currently available uh, Vera modem. Hey, Joel, um, yeah. Jerry? Can, this, yeah. can this run through any sort of sound card system like your, your digital? Yeah, it's, it sure can. And, and we'll show you a slide of that uh, in just a few minutes. Now, when you um, uh, start out, and, and sorry, I'll, I'll just back up and say, uh, if anybody else has a question at any time, don't be uh, shy. Just unmute yourself and, and ask right away. No, no worries about that. Um, probably already figured out we're pretty informal. Um, so the software is set up so that it will do repeated attempts at trying to connect to the gateway. It just sends out a little burst saying, you know, here I am, this is my call sign, I want to connect to gateway number, whatever, the call sign of the gateway. Um, and it, it will do that up to 10 times uh, because these, well, a couple of reasons. One is, of course, propagation uh, varies widely up and down and so first time you send the message, uh, you know, the, the destination gateway may not be uh, able to hear you. Um, but more likely, these gateways uh, are, uh, are just sitting on different frequency as you try to call one. Um, many of them are scanning uh, two or three or four different frequencies on different frequency bands. And they will sit on each uh, frequency for a few seconds, listening for connection requests. So uh, you may have to uh, connect, uh, try to connect five, six, seven times. Uh, and I've, I've even had it happen where um, I've gone through 10 times and it's failed. And I wait a few seconds and try again and it, and it connects right up because I just this time synchronized with, I transmitted with, um, but on to the gateway when it actually was on the same frequency as me. Okay, um, here's a slide showing a very common setup. This is what I've got here, the, the Kenwood TS590. It's got a USB sound card capability built right into the radio. There are getting to be more of them like this these days, and that's really, really nice. I like it. Uh, I like it a lot. Um, so if you were thinking about doing this, I would suggest looking for a radio that's got um, a USB cable, but a connector, but not just USB. I, I noticed the other day that the Yaesu FT891, it's a mobile HF rig, uh, so quite compact. It has a USB port, but it's only for control of the radio. And that's kind of boring to me. I don't know why they did that, because it's a modern radio. Um, if you have the um, <clears throat> sound card capability built right in, then you can both control the radio's frequency, when it's going to transmit, when it's going to receive, um, and uh, and send the audio to the radio as data, of course, over USB, and it converts it to, to, to tones. Now, if, if you don't have one of these modern radios, or if you've got a modern radio that just doesn't have this capability, then you go this route instead. All right, so there's a, a ICOM 706 that's a nice radio from a few years ago but no uh, no capability like the 590 has so you you buy a little interface box um, the, the lower one's called a signal link usb the upper one is a, a rig blaster advantage uh, by west mountain radio there's a couple of others as well out there so they're usb uh, they have a usb connection to the computer um, uh, but then they have, uh, in addition, um, a sound card capability in them. Uh, so you'll have transmit and receive audio going to the radio, but also um, another cable uh, controlling the uh, when the radio is transmitting and receiving and uh, telling it to change frequency to an appropriate wind link gateway frequency. All right. So these are the two basic ways of, um, of running this sort of thing. 
right? And so there's no need to worry about having the latest and greatest radio. Um, um, you know, you, you can get an older radio. And uh, I, I just happen to know Mr. Olke uh, on the call has actually made this work with a, a, a Kenwood, I believe it's a TS520. I hope I got that right, Ken. But that's a, a, a rig that's still got a couple of tubes in it. <laughs> and, and he was making it work. So that's, you know, uh, gets a little more challenging, but there's a lot of a lot of possibilities out there. You don't need to have a thousand multi thousand dollar radio. And another option not shown here that's even simpler is you could easily homebrew an interface, a sound card interface. Mm -hmm. So the signal link, for example, when you plug it in via USB to your computer, shows up as a new sound card. But you can use the built-in sound card or outboard sound card of your computer and take the speaker and mic or, you know, line in inputs, outputs, and so on uh, through isolation transformers and that sort of thing, and then run that into your radio. So there's a whole range, you know, from buying the latest, greatest radio to making this work with pretty much any radio that you've got on your bench. Yeah. So, you know, if you wanted to dedicate... Uh, a radio just for wind link messaging and stuff, and you want to keep your main rig for doing all your fun stuff, um, you know, then that's a way to do that as well. You could easily build your own interface too. Mm -hmm. So, so this is a, do that too. this is Very a good. mode like uh, some of the other, like if you're using your sound card or your signal link for RTTY or for FT8, you can do the same thing with this. Mm -hmm. It's just different software. I yeah. was wondering, is this included in Ham Radio Deluxe as another mode? No, it's not. Um, I was just talking with somebody about Ham Radio Deluxe the other day, and you know, it's kind of like um, the, the some of the newer folks on the call may, may not be old enough to remember AOL, America Online. You know, it was a an all in one internet kind of tool it included a web browser it had chat programs that had email and uh, <clears throat> uh, buy and sell and all sorts of things all in one package a great thing but um, it just couldn't keep up because there, there's always something new popping up um, I have ham radio deluxe and it's in a way it's similar it's got tons of features it's got a, um, a log, it's got a way of uh, uh, an app for controlling the radio, for controlling a rotator. If you're running on HF and you want to control your rotator or VHF, uh, it's got a digital mode program called DM780, and it's got tons of um, digital modes in it, um, uh, like Olivia and Radio Teletype and um, Throb and Thor and Hell Schreiber. It's incredible the the list uh but what are 95 percent of people using right now they're using ft8 um for for just making general contact not not for email um so you know it's it's really tough uh for the hrd po folks to to keep up and um, that's life i think they understand that um most of their their other features like I use their log book all the time. Okay, that's, you know, that's good enough. I bought the software 10 years ago and I'll keep using it for the logging if nothing else. Um, anyway, so yeah, it, it, uh, uh, WinLink is not in there either uh, and nor is the Vera that we use uh, for WinLink. Um, it's just um, too many options and it, it costs a lot of money and a lot of time with the programmers trying to catch up with every mode. Let's have a look at the uh, the next uh, option, which is doing this over VHF or UHF radios. Okay, so you, you could have here, again, you've got your computer running WinLink Express, the software. Um, in this case, there's a serial cable going to a modem. Um, this is the Cantronics KPC3. Uh, which I have one of, and um, there are many other modems, and you can buy one pretty cheap these days uh, if you buy one used because they're, they're you know, um, this, this packet mode, just generally speaking, has been uh, long ago, actually, kind of fell out of favor, but it's come back um, for use with Winlink. 
to uh, to connect to VHF and UHF gateways. So uh, these modems are are becoming more popular again. Um, and and as Dan mentioned a few minutes ago, you can do a less expensive version if you're into hacking your own stuff together. There's little tiny interfaces that uh, just use a couple of chips and a few capacitors and you know, just hack it together in a in a, <laughs> a little tiny box. You know, various things. Um, the radio that's shown here is just a common radio. Um, there are so many. Some of them have dedicated, a lot of them have dedicated uh, ports on the back. Uh, you can just connect and maybe you can even buy a cable that goes from the KPC3 to, the, to your radio. You don't have to build your own cable even. That would be nice. In my case, I just happened to have a, uh, when I discovered that, uh, that FARS Club uh, has a, a couple of gateways on, on UHF, I said, well, I don't have a UHF radio. Darn. Oh, yes, I do. I've got a dual band handheld. So I've got my Yesu FT530 dual band handheld <laughs> wired up to my Cantronics modem, and it's working great. No problem at all. Um, so the, again, you know, lots of options, uh, fairly inexpensive. Uh, if, if, the, if there was a gateway on VHF, man, there's, there's old two meter handhelds galore. All right. Another option. Um, is if there were a gateway running uh, uh, Vera instead of uh, a packet, uh, you could use the Vera FM software, which would be sitting on the computer. And so then you just need the software and, uh, and the radio, you know, compatible radio. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, there's, again, there's various ways to do this sort of thing. All right. Um, Speaking of other digital software, I did, this doesn't really apply to our main topic, but I did want to remind folks that, uh, you know, there are other modes uh, for, for digital, lots and lots of them. Um, and many of them do indeed use the same hardware setup uh, as used by Winlink. So once you've got the basic hardware setup, whether it's on VHF, UHF, uh, FM, or whether it's on uh, HF, whatever, um, it's going to let you play with other software too. Uh, I'm, I was talking about it just before we started. Uh, I'd gone on a bit of a, a, <laughs> a me contest um, a few days ago and made um, a couple hundred contacts in 52 different countries. That was pretty cool. Uh, with FT8, it's just amazing how many countries or entities they call them because aren't, some aren't literally countries. Um, a lot of these more rare ones are on uh, FT8 these days because they can make a lot of contacts in a very short time um, where some of them would be on F uh, on, on CW. Um, many of them still are. Um, so they, that kind of weeds out the vast majority of hams who would just flood them otherwise. But with uh, FT8, uh, they can handle like, <laughs> that vast flood. So... Uh, all right, uh, a variant of, of FD8 is called JS8 Call, and um, it allows conversational contacts, whereas FD8 is really very formulaic, just um, canned messages. Uh, and within a minute and a half or, or, or less, in some cases, you can have a, a, an FD8 contact done and in the log. With JS8, you can actually type at each other and, and um, have a nice conversation. All right. Um, APRS, yeah, that's a digital mode, right? Um, of course, it's built into a lot of handhelds and some mobiles, um, basically for position reporting. That's called, what is it? Automated position reporting system, right? Um, but you can even do text messaging over it, I believe now. So, uh, you know, APRS is, is kind of interesting and fun. And my brother's had it for years in his truck and he drives all over North America and you can keep track of where the heck is he this week. Um, Whisper, WSPR, the weak signal propagation reporter, um, is kind of a fun one. You can be running a, a, a little dedicated radio that just puts out one watt or something like that, uh, and it just has a very simple processor to generate Whisper messages to say, here's, you know, the call sign and the frequency and the time of day, and, and then you can then uh, go onto a website later, and, and um, people who received that message all over the globe um, will, will, you know, a list will be generated saying, hey, here's who, who could hear your message. 
That's kind of neat. PSK31, uh, or BPSK31 is the full name. Um, it's phase shift keying in, a, what is it, 31 different tones or something. Anyway, that one was super popular for years. Uh, and um, I mention it primarily because um, a JS8 call would, would be the, the modern version of it, I suppose. But PSK31 is still around and it's built into a lot of people's radios. So I do mention it for that reason. Okay, we better hurry on here. Radio teletype. This is seriously antique stuff, you know, from the 1950s or whenever, but there's still people running our TTY um, with their digital modems, right? Same hardware, software as, as uh, uh, you know, can do a lot of other digital modes, okay? Mostly used in, uh, in contests just for fun, I guess. Okay, let's move on here. Uh, the Winlink system uh, in the area here. This is on UHF, 431 megahertz. Um, there's a repeat or a gateway rather uh, up at the CTV tower up in the northwest of the city. Um, V6FAR-10. Uh, there's another FAR-11, I, I believe the High River Hospital. And uh, to reach High River from Calgary or, or vice versa to reach uh, uh, Calgary from High River, um, you know, if High River is having a serious event, um, they may not be able to reach Calgary direct. So there is a uh, digipeter, a digital repeater um, in the Alder site area. And, and Dan included a photo of, of the hardware required. It's really just a radio, a TNC, and a power supply. Uh, I think those cavities allow multi-coupling into another antenna. But Dan, if you've got me a, a comment there, feel free. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the whole package that we recently put into uh, the Alderside repeater site. And um, so quite simply, it, it is a data radio and a TNC. Uh, it does its own digipeat. In this case, it doesn't require a computer. And yeah, the cavity filters are multi-coupler because we are uh, sharing the same antenna of uh, at, at the um, so the other thing on that map shows uh, of course where they are and um, those of you that um, are have been watching the progression of this uh, development of our infrastructure will see that they were recently renamed uh, you know to represent the club so when they were in test mode they had different call signs uh, this is now their final uh, production uh, call signs for those nodes. The green part is what effectively is predicted to be uh, coverage with just a low power uh, uh, type of system. So if you've got a TNC with a handheld radio, you know, maybe a mag mount antenna or something like that, low power, uh, that uh, that's the predicted, you know, using the traditional um, coverage prediction software uh, known as radio mobile uh, to show us where the coverage is. Um, we can expand on that network over time. We have some plans to do that over the next while, but uh, you know, we really wanted to get this up and running. You know, high water season is just around the corner in June. Uh, you just never know. So uh, you know, now that these are up and running and very stable, it would also make sense to have people try it and get familiar with the interface and sending messages and so on and so forth. All right. We're going to do that here in just a very few minutes. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, better keep hustling on here. There's a few slides uh, that here that Dan has created, just giving an idea of how uh, typically you would interface with uh, with Winlink Express. Once you're in the software, um, there's a you go to the message uh, menu and say I want a new message or there's just a button that says you know create a new message. Um, opens up an email uh, form. Uh, looks very much like a standard email. If you want to use a specific template, um, you don't always need to do this, but um, certainly quite uh, quite commonly done uh, if you're interfacing with a, a 
government agency or a you know a disaster in a disaster whatever you click on the just select template he's highlighted that and you pick the appropriate one from the list uh it pops up um, that uh, web page and uh i just <laughs> remembered i animated these bullet points I better keep up so in this case he, he somebody's created a template called radiogram great okay so it pops up here's what it looks like um and you're going to enter data into all the, the boxes where it's required um, you don't have to enter everything all right when you're done you click the submit button in the lower left and uh, that populates everything you've entered in a specific format into the email all right and i do this all the time or have done all the time with with cfars um, we we have a, a certain um, specific forms for that sort of thing if you're not I mean, using a template of course you just go ahead and type however you want to type Go ahead. The format of that text, uh, as you can see, was transcribed from the, the template form, <clears throat> um, actually puts it into a format that on the receiving end will then be recognized as that particular template. And you can display it when you the recipient reads the message. It will open the template, pop the text into the right boxes. That's right. Yeah. And there inbound message will look exactly like the radiogram form from the previous slide. So a that's a really cool read, yeah. function. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, and then of course, if you uh, uh, carry a, a portable printer or something with you, then, you know, you can print it and hand it off to the individual and they read this thing in that same format that they're accustomed to. And uh, so it, um, uh, it's a really good communication method at that point. And mm -hmm. it also gives you um, a log of all of the received and transmitted messages, right? Say during uh, uh, an incident of some sort. The uh, One of the key things that's not intuitive in this mail client is you have to post it to the outbox. You don't just mm -hmm. sort of hit send, receive and it just happens. It has to be posted to the outbox. So you click on that uh, as shown up in the top right. Mm -hmm. And then in the outbox, so the little screenshot there shows that outbound message that is waiting to be sent in the outbox. If there's messages in your outbox, then they haven't been sent yet. And by the way, if you uh, if you wanted to send a peer to peer message uh, before you click post to outbox, you would hear as send as instead of winlink message, you'd change that to peer to peer message. And then uh, uh, in that uh, session selector, you would pick you know uh, Vera HF peer to peer. Okay, uh, what else have we got here? Select and then the you click on the open session on the bottom left there. And you select the session, of course, you know, in this case, we're going to do packet win link and you hit open session to actually then start. What happens then is you wait for your radio and TNC to initialize little blurby stuff goes through. In my case, I'm using um, my Kenwood D 700 on the B side, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and when the, um, uh, when the uh, TNC is ready, then, you know, it tells me ready, at which point now I'm ready to start to transmit, you know, the radio is set to 431.0 and so on and so forth. And um, so you hit start and <clears throat> away it goes. Um, you can, one thing also to note is the connection type. So if you know you can hit the station, the Windlink station directly. So you're in Calgary, you know that you can reach uh, V6FAR-10. You can just hit direct instead of Digipeter, put in V6FAR-10. The VIA boxes are kind of grayed out and it will connect to that station directly. Um, Otherwise, if you can't, so in my case, you know, um, 
uh, I can't quite get into maybe with high power. I might be able to get into uh, uh, into FAR-10, but typically I'll go through the DigiPeter. So connection type is DigiPeter. I select VA, uh, V6 FAR-10, or I can go to High River, which is dash 11 if I choose, via V6 HRA-8. And then I hit start and away it goes. So right. that's what actually initiates the conversation to the node. And then from there, you know, it does all the things in the back end that it needs to do to connect to the CMS. It will send the messages, <clears throat> download any waiting messages and so on um, until it's done and away you go. So next, before we get to the next slide, which is some questions. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll hold off. Let's do a, uh, let's do a um, actual live demo and hope the demo gods are smiling down upon us. <laughs> I just sent right. you a demo message. <clears throat> Oh, thanks. All right, I, I'm going to create one myself. Uh, VE6EI at you notice winlink.org. So I'll just say testing. What the heck? Simple message there, right? And that's being sent. It's gone to the outbox. Now, uh, do remember that this takes a little bit of time to get uh, where it's going because it's got to go through the internet to a CMS. It's got to be propagated to all the CMSs and then to the to the uh, 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 the RMSs as well. So it's kind of a multi-stage thing. All right, I'm going to start because this is the more likely one to work with um, uh, the connection to uh, VHF to to uh, Dan's system, the FARS system, really. Um, okay, so here is. Um, well, you know what? Well, uh, it's going to take a minute or two to get through. There's all sorts of things. You can create folders, of course, inbox, outbox, deleted items, all the usual things. You can create personal folders. Um, it keeps track of email uh, addresses you've emailed to or, or received from, and, and that's helpful just as a reminder. Um, there's so much here, I don't have time. But in setup, settings and setup, you're going to put your call sign, your address, um, a recovery email address, your home address. Notice here service codes, public and MCOM. All right, so any of those gateways that are listed as public, uh, you're going to have access to those. And MCOM is emergency communications. All right, um, if I were uh, using my CFARS, um, uh, you can have multiple um, instances or, or personalities here. Uh, I could be using my CFARS one, and you might have a different service code there for, for CFARS specifically. All right, so there's various things you can set up here. Um, I don't want to spend too much time, but there's something really cool here called WinLink Catalog Request, which I just discovered yesterday. Um, you can go in there and, and you update the catalog, and the catalog contains all these reports that you can request a weather candidate report. You can say, I want a report for Southern Manitoba. Let's post that request. Oh, well, I have to double click. There it shows up and you post it. Good, okay. Now I've got uh, one item in the outbox. That's that request, all right? Uh, nothing in the inbox because I haven't connected yet to receive that email. Um, that I created and somebody was uh, maybe Vince chimed in with I just sent one as well. Um, so we'll see what happens here. All right, I could select Telnet, but that's kind of boring. Honestly, you just click Telnet WinLink, it opens a window, you hit start and it connects to the, to the CMS directly and you're done in seconds. So that's kind of boring. I'll select pack. And there's no RF involved, yeah, which is no really, <laughs> that's point? really sad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So here we go with a packet uh, session. Come on, where'd my window go? Got buried for some reason. La, la, la. Hang on. Question here. Yeah. If you're sending a, an email via WinLink on HF, mm -hmm. uh, do you know that it arrives at the other station? Does it notify you? Or if, if the guy just has a receiver that's on frequency and receives it, 
can it notify you through the internet that it's been received or does it uh, you can it? do a request read receipt just like you can do with with standard email programs but um, most people don't like that very much because um, of the fact that uh, um, you end up um, generating double the traffic right especially if you're in the middle of a big uh, event and uh, and there's, the system's already overloaded and All it's right. like stalking. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> likes to be stalked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But don't All you right. want to know if your email went through? Let's see. So, Jerry, the short answer is the system is highly available and robust enough that it will get through, right? Because you have transmitted it when you uploaded the message. Now, the person, the recipient may not be checking their messages every day or 20 times a day or whatever. So, you know, if somebody doesn't check their messages, their win link messages for a month, right, then, um, yeah, they won't have seen it, right? So now that comes down to that discipline of the communication between you and your recipient, right? So, but to your question, has it been delivered? It has been delivered to the CMS and it's sitting there waiting to be downloaded by the recipient. Okay. But that part, who knows, right? It's up to them when they do that. I'm just thinking in terms of an emergency message that you want to make sure that the recipient received it before you. Uh... So, so in a emergency situation scenario, like, you know, a declared disaster and so on, when everybody is constantly checking, that's one thing. But, you know, to send an urgent message to your buddy and, and to know, you know, when they're going to get it. Yeah, that's, that's not the intent of WinLink, right? It's just meant to get there to that person when they download their messages. But you do get confirmation that the um, CMS has received it, right? There's oh, the you see that in, instantly during your upload session. Absolutely. You see that the message... Uh, you'll see it actually uh, when Joel sends the messages. There's even a progress bar in the, the client part. And it, you know, your sent messages go from left to right and your downloaded messages go from right to left as a right. progress bar. It's exactly. kind of clever. <laughs> um, I, I was having a little technical difficulty for some reason with Zoom running my packet win link session window wasn't showing up uh, on the screen, um, but can you see it now? Yes. Yes, good. Okay, so here's this window that, that looks just like Dan's screen capture from a few minutes ago, and I'm doing a direct connection to V6FAR-10, which is up at uh, CTV uh, Tower. And uh, we could switch to a peer-to-peer -peer session. We could go to settings and say, I want a Cantronics KPC3 modem or, or some other kind of Cantronics modem or some other manufacturer. There's all sorts of settings in here, okay? Uh, once you've got the correct settings, you hit start. It initializes the modem. And I'm looking at the modem. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but I'm seeing a transmit light or a seed light. But here it comes in very quickly very quickly. You can see it says FARS node V6FAR-10, the frequency. There goes the message. Did you see it? It's pretty quick. All right. Um, so it sends pretty darn quickly. Oh, look at that. There's two messages waiting for me. Yes, one was from Vince. So it asks you, um, do you want to receive these messages right now? Maybe you're on a really slow link and uh, you, you say, oh, no, I don't want all those. Those are just junk. Uh, I'll just deselect this, this spam here from this. I don't know who this LK guy is. <laughs> but um, if you want certain messages, you check them or just leave them checked and you hit download, right? It always does uploads or, or sending first because that's, a, that's kind of a safety thing. Maybe you're sending an email saying, please help. You know, here's our latitude, longitude where our boat is sinking. So uh, after that, uh, then... It asks, okay, are you ready to receive some emails? And there you go. This is so quick uh, on, on VHF, UHF. It, uh, 
it's running at 1200 baud, which admittedly is pretty slow compared to the standard internet way of doing things, but there it is. Okay. Oh, look at that. Uh, Vince created this in a template, a bulletin template. So it, uh, it populates. All right. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Thank you for that, Vince. Um, or you could just, of course, have sent just a standard message. And this one I just sent from my Outlook. And there's the results. Pretty cool. I know we're going a little over time, but I'm just going to spend a couple more minutes and do a, uh, a Vera HF connection. There won't be any emails waiting, but that's okay because it takes time. Okay. So it's launching the Vera TNC. I don't know if you just heard a did it it my radio just it just connected to my radio. And here's the Vera TNC right here. Instead of being a piece of hardware with, with some software running on it, it's my computer with this modem software running on it. Okay, there's some settings here for Vera. Uh, that's my CFARS call sign, my HAM call sign, and it's registered in this case. I had to pay a little money and it, it'll run a little faster as a result. You can also go into the sound card menu and you can adjust the drive level. Um, so that you don't overdrive your transmitter and create distortion. Basically what you do is you key, key up the transmitter with the tune button and you watch to see if there's any uh, ALC action. Um, that's the sort of thing you see when you talk into the you know, microphone while you're transmitting and, and the instructions say, adjust your mic gain until the ALC is hitting this point. Um, we aim, it, uh, aim for it to be basically the ALC barely moving or not moving at all. Um, you can see where here's where the audio input is coming from a USB codec or uh, decoder decoder basically and the output goes to the USB audio all right as well all right so that's how uh, it gets connected in uh, from the radio to uh, the software all right so now I want to um, choose uh, a connection well um, oh, by the way, you, there are settings here. There's settings all over the place. You can go to Vera TNC setup. Um, oh, here's where the modem is located. You know, for example, that's just setup stuff. That's boring. But the radio setup, here's my radio. There's tons of radios that it'll, it'll talk with. Icons and Kenwoods and Yesus galore. Okay. And some uh, others as well. Okay. Um, what else? Channel selection. This is pretty important. Um, you can update your, your list here by the, with the internet and you just click that button as long as you've got an internet connection, right? You can see it's updating pretty quickly. Last time I updated it was midday, so I'm going to do it now that it's gotten on to uh, well into the evening here. Okay. You can see the, uh, all the columns that, that Dan and I were talking about, the frequency that this uh, particular station is sitting on, his Vera mode where he's located, that's a Maidenhead grid square, the hours that this station is operational. Some of them, like this one way down here, is only operational between 0, 0,000 and 1,600 uh, UTC, um, maybe because he wants to have it reserved for his own fooling around, you know, the rest of the day, right? So anyway, we could pick one of these. Um, VA7EDG, yeah, this is the one that I found worked best for me earlier. So I have selected, I'll click select and some beeping on my radio and the radio is suddenly on 3594. That's in the, uh, in the 80 meter band. Notice it says the center frequency 3595.5. It's always uh, pre presuming a three kilohertz channel and uh, the center of that's kilohertz and a half above. It doesn't really matter. Well, it does it <laughs> later, but uh, not for our quick demo. All right, so what I need to do is make sure that my antenna is the correct antenna. Yes, it's my big uh, off-center fed dipole. I'm gonna hit the, uh, I'm gonna key up the radio to make sure that I my SWR is low. Yes, okay, so everything seems good. I'm gonna turn up the volume. Oh, you can hear somebody there. Did you hear that? There's just one little blurb and I'm, I'm going to have the uh, the transmit monitor turned on, so you'll be able to hear me transmitting. But there's that's somebody 
saying, hello, are you out there? Are you out there? Okay, so I don't want to transmit over top of him. I'll give him a few more seconds. If he doesn't quit, I'll, uh, I'll go elsewhere. But uh, just like everything in ham radio, you want to listen before transmitting, right? Uh, a lot of people running digital modes kind of forget that and they just start blasting away. Okay, I'm gonna give it about two more attempts here. If he doesn't quit, I'll, I'll uh, try a different uh, gateway. And he doesn't seem to be wanting to quit. Well, sure, since I said it, he did. <laughs> That's okay. Now he started again. <laughs> okay. A lot of us will. We'll, we'll send 10 requests and you say, well, maybe he still just wasn't on the right channel at the right time. Let's try a different one. So let's try the next one in the list. This one's somewhere probably in California, K6, 7100. So, okay. Make sure I'm on correct band. No, I'll turn the volume up here. You hear that? That's. And you want to be watching the uh, modem on the left here. It gives you a spectrum analyzer type scope, and it shows you the amount of data or the how rapidly that data is, data is being sent and received. This is quite a good connection. Look how quickly it's sending. Oh, a test from VE6EN. Look at that, awesome. Okay. Well, this connection's pretty good. Not as good as packet, but 175 bits per second is not bad. So I'm gonna download those two messages. When it speeds up, it starts sounding really quite annoying. When it's just um, initializing a, a connection, it's much slower and it's um, just kind of a burbling, almost watery kind of sound. It's doing handshaking and sort of trying to see how much bandwidth and throughput it can it uh, uh, the propagation will support, exactly. and you know at which point then it just goes pedal to the metal based on what it figured out mm -hmm. um, a lot of good information in here if you if you knew how to decode it but we, we're not going to get into that today you can see this message is downloading much more slowly than the previous one um, because we are on a relatively slow uh, 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 hf link with uh, fading and noise on on 431 megahertz there's pretty much no fading, it's, very little noise. There'll be full quieting typically, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, we do run the squelch open on the radios so that we let um, uh, carrier detect take uh, uh, action take place on within the modem, within the TMCs. The other thing about Vera is their level of error correction is actually, that's kind of their, uh, their primary claim to fame. Mm -hmm. And because of that, that's partly why they can get uh, the throughput, the higher throughput that, uh, that you can on HF. Mm -hmm. So see, it is yeah. actually quite good. But then, you know, if you look at the summary at, when a message has been received and you look at the, um, the number of bytes that it was downloaded and things like that, um, you know, like for example, the last message there was 177 bytes came down. Yeah. It seemed like fast in four seconds, but at the blistering speed of 2,255 bytes per minute, normally we talk about, you know, bandwidth on networks and stuff in bits per second, megabits, gigabits per second. This is bytes per minute. Mm -hmm. So we're not breaking any land speed records by any stretch. But, you know, certainly the key thing is that this message will get there. Mm -hmm. And you, you can, uh, oh, was there a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, so on HF, uh, station A is sending an email uh, to station B, supposedly. Um, 
but you're listening in on that frequency. So you can intercept any of these emails and print out the messages? There is a monitor mode um, in the, uh, the Vera modem. Uh, and I believe you can monitor while, while you are not connected to somebody else. Um, so, you know, this stuff is not inherently uh, encrypted or anything like that. Um, with CFARS, we could encrypt things because we're not using ham bands, but it is, it's not legal to encrypt anything on the ham bands. So it's just like if you're having a, a nice QSO on 20 meters, you never know who's listening. And, and that's, just, that's just the facts of life. There's, there should be no expectation of privacy <laughs> on any of the airwaves, right? If you think about it. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to point out that um, we started out going really fast. Oh man, it was great. 185 bits per second or whatever it was. And then it slowed way down. And that's why this, this channel just took a deep fade, but it's doing retries. You can see a knack may show up occasionally. That means no acknowledgement from the other end. Uh, an act says, hey, I, I just sent a, uh, the other guy sent me a message. I'm acknowledging it. Um, there are other things that can happen. By message here, Joel means like a section. Think of it as a packet mm -hmm. um, in networking terminology, right? You send a packet and you wait a particular time and you expect uh, an acknowledgement that it was received. Uh, and a NAC means... I didn't get an act from you, so I'm going to retransmit that packet. This is part of the error correction that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So instead of like a spray and pray kind of thing and hope that the message got there, this will retry each of the sections of the message as in packets until they are 100% have been delivered and acknowledge that they have been received at the other end. Yeah, and it, it sends... Uh you know, it breaks a, a, even a small message up into ma many smaller chunks so that if, if, if conditions are bad and, and that individual transmission fails, it doesn't take long to resend it. Uh, and this is what's been happening with us here. You know, we're getting very slow uh, update rates. Once this first email comes through, I think I'll just I'll cancel because uh, we don't have all night. But um, are, there, are there different types of frames other than the... Uh... Just the uh, the message payload, is there uh, frames for error correction or is it done all in the message? That's built into the, when it's packetized. Yeah. Yeah, you have F, like forward error correction bits and uh, all the usual stuff, I do. Yeah. And in the bottom of the Vera panel, right, you can see like right now it's in receive mode, you'll see it switch to TX. Whenever the, you get a horizontal black bar, that's where the radio is. That's when you're transmitting. Um, you know, then you can see the two call signs that are connected, right? Um, 18 bits per second. The total download so far is at 1,793 bytes. Uh, the speed, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the thing about this is, and, and it was sort of briefly shown and we won't go into the setup and stuff like that. What Vera does is it sets up um, a network listener on the local machine. So the software talks over IP to another piece of software on the machine. So it's already been converted into uh, IP packets. And then it's just a matter of then Vera encodes them into audio and sends them out. Um, through your transmitter and same on the receive side. So um, there's multiple processes that talk to one another in this whole chain um, between the, the transmitter and the receiver. Right on. Um, I did want to point out just before I depart here, um, it gives you a few useful things like AFC is automatic frequency control. If your radio and the other guy's radio were bang on the same frequency, this dial would be pointed straight up uh, when you're listening to it. Uh, usually you're off. This one was off about 60 hertz. That's totally fine. If you get into the yellow area, it, it, it's going to have a little more trouble decoding it. SN is signal to noise ratio. And this software does very well at uh, decoding very weak signals, uh, not as well as a, a really super weak signal mode like FD8, but, but not far from it. Okay, so that's the, 
you, you want the signal to noise ratio ideally to be higher and then you're going to have a higher signal uh, a, a data rate for sure um, but this the software will pick a data rate uh, that is appropriate for, for and it's adaptable yeah. as well that's the other thing so mm -hmm. as conditions change because they can be quite dynamic on hf then you'll see it throttle up and down up and down if it gets uh, confident and uh, the throughput is reliable it can mm -hmm. speed up and then if it starts to see a bunch of noise and a lot of retries then it throttles back yeah so it's very dynamic even through the same uh call or the same conversation right on so you you can see here this email thanks uh, andrew for sending that um came um via where to come from k6 mby that's the rms that we connected to okay the message server all the way down in california and oh what else i i sent a request for weather um i can't even remember which one now but uh, i got that uh data back for oh, southern manitoba of all things all right so that's pretty darn cool um you'll find that these um these requests are tied typically and, th and this was again this was in the winlink catalog requests weather canada and i picked you know man southern manitoba this is for you won't find one for southern alberta because there's no big bodies of water here anywhere there's a big body of water i mean nicaragua right oh man or you can even download uh news um from from different news sources like the bbc if you're way out at sea and you and you can't get anything you know you're going to be pretty happy to have that okay um i think i'd better uh wrap it here because we are way over time I sure appreciate everyone um, staying with us for this. Uh, Dan and I get excited. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty <laughs> cool stuff. So uh, we appreciate your, your time. Um, uh, first off, does anyone have any uh, questions about this? And then we'll move on to the, uh, the next topic. Uh, I have a question, Joel. Mm -hmm. um, around the RDOP mode and Vera mode is... Is there any sort of movement to have one over the other or are they? Yeah, um, RDOP, I think uh, was, oh, I used to know what that acronym was, but it, it's it's older and it's uh, it's fading away and where Vera is is coming on quite strong. So I would say Vera is is the uh, the, the path forward here uh, primarily. Pactor again is, is still fairly popular, but very expensive. So uh, it's uh, slowly fading as well. It's the cost of the barrier to entry is significant. And that turns a lot of people off. Yeah. Um, you know, the sure. cost of Vera, uh, a license per call sign, not per mode. So if you buy, uh, like you saw in, in Joel's screen, he's got two call signs registered. It's like 69 US dollars uh, for a license for a call sign but it gives you both modes, both FM and HF. And, uh, you know, it supports the development of, uh, of that software and so on. It's been proving quite successful. Now, from an infrastructure perspective, that also requires a commitment on the back end. So, you know, we've set up two uh, Winlink stations, two nodes that are using Packet or AX.25. Uh, we could on a different with a different radio and the associated software and a, another sound card, we could actually run uh, Vera FM uh, on one or both of those nodes. You know, uh, it adds some complexity and so on. Um, we're trying this a couple of different ways. So we're running Windows software uh, at the Calgary location. And we're running this on Linux down in High River. So two different pieces of software, they work exactly the same way. Um, to get into Vera would, you know, open up a different can of worms, but we might even look at that at some point. And a small uh, industrial PC, perhaps. Well, yeah, like we've got, you know, a small form factor uh, machine up at CTV in High River. Uh, it's a slightly older, uh, well-experienced IBM server class machine, you know, so it's a rack mount, one rack unit, et cetera, et cetera. 
So, you know, we've got some beefy horsepower there. And um, so, you know, these are options that we may or may not look at in the future. It depends where this goes, you know, and what the, the user demand is. But at this point, um, you know, everybody's got old TNCs kicking around. And, you know, that's kind of the, uh, the easiest, shortest path to uh, a successful packet station. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we, should, we should wrap it up here. I think um, any last minute question before we send it back to Jerry? Doesn't sound like it. So uh, thanks everybody, much appreciated. And we'll uh, pass it back to uh, Jerry. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody. And Dan, a great presentation.